Hi, I'm Lydia Foreman, part of the Theo Ed Talks team, and I'm here with Mike McCarg, who is one of our speakers. And he's better known to some as Science Mike. Uh, and I've heard, I first heard of Mike, uh, which I'm sure is the case for many others, by listening to the Liturgist podcast, which he co-hosts with Michael Gunger, and now with two other hosts. Is that right? That's right. Uh, Hillary McBride and William Matthews have joined us. Great. Yeah, and this podcast is super popular. It's got a million downloads a month, over 250,000 subscribers, which tells you that you've clearly hit a nerve with your audience, right? Um, so how would you describe the typical liturgist fan? Well, we always uh, said our work was about meeting the needs of the spiritually homeless and frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so people who are in faith communities, or not in faith communities, but find themselves at odds with kind of the cultural center of gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe they're too churchy for, church, for a non-church environment. So they're an, uh, an agnostic or an atheist who has some kind of spiritual leaning or practice and their friends think they're strange, or they have questions that uh, their church thinks are dangerous, yeah. and uh, so they find themselves feeling frustrated. Then there are people who have actually been exiled from their communities mm -hmm. and from their families for spiritual reasons, that it's not necessarily just theological questioning, that can also be life transitions. We have a lot of uh, LGBTQ listeners who have been kind of exiled from their Mm. their families and their religious communities, mm -hmm. and they find themselves spiritually homeless. Right. So I think uh, the way I've always kind of summarized it is to say it, we're just kind of the aisle of misfit toys. Yeah. And I know from listening to you on your podcast and from your book that you grew up in an evangelical Christian uh, household, and you talk about in your book how you lived for a period of time as a closeted atheist, um, and you were, you know, you risked losing friends, family, your community, I mean, just your whole life, basically. Uh, and I was just wondering, do you think if you had been raised in a more mainline or progressive Christian uh, home that you would have felt that same risk? Um, or do you even think that you would have been brought to such a crisis of faith at all? You know, I think we often, we hear other people's stories as warnings. And we feel this need to try to do this right. So someone hears my story of kind of faith lost and says, how can we avoid that for our children? Mm -hmm. And I guess what I would say is it doesn't matter what story you grew up in. At some point, it won't fit anymore. Right. Yeah. So sure, if I would have grown up in a mainline household, I doubt I would have struggled with biblical literalism the way that yeah. I did. But we have really good data that tells us that mainline people uh, actually leave their faith more often mm. than evangelicals do. Mm. So it's not simply a matter of hermeneutics or theology, or all the things we think of. What happens in churches, as well as other uh, communal and social structures, is an inflexibility about letting people change and grow. Mm -hmm. So no matter what community you're in, there are some questions that can't be asked. There are some places that are too taboo to go. And the goal of my work is not to help people avoid becoming atheists mm -hmm. or uh, anything like that. It's to, to help people learn how to relate to each other mm -hmm. through major life transitions and changes and maintain friendship and maintain yeah. affection and maintain mutual care and understand that like none of us really have that much figured out. And the times we believe we do are when we're the most set up to put ourselves in a crisis, not only with our community, but with ourselves. Mm. And in your book, you know, you, science was really at that sticking point for you because you have this, you know, passion for science, always have. And I think a lot of people in this, you know, think this whole science and faith debate is really only a product of, you know, evangelicalism and progressives have really never had a problem with this. It's never let them bother them. But for you, uh, just transitioning to being a progressive Christian, you know, that didn't really, like, settle things for you. Like, that didn't, you know, just end the conversation. So why was that? Um, well, I mean, even progressive Christian is a label I would hold pretty loosely. Right. Uh, I'm always careful in rooms full of Christians to say that in most rooms, at least a third of the people would not agree that I'm a Christian at all. <laughs> so it's very much a, a point of identity I hold to. Um, and in terms of... of, of putting that conflict to bed. You know, when people say that faith and science aren't in conflict, I wonder, is it do they not understand science? <laughs> do they not understand faith? Or do they not understand both? Right. 
the fact is, uh, science is a very particular way of making inquiries about the natural world. And any time religions also make inquiries into the natural world, faith and science will right. and must come into conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's not for me, to, I'm not saying that faith shouldn't make inquiry into the way things are in the natural world. And, that, and I certainly think faith should make uh, statements into how we make moral decisions and ethical decisions relate to each other. But my point is, people who are in search of some kind of skeleton key mm -hmm. that will let their faith and science coexist um, and mesh, mm -hmm. I think are facing an impossible task. And it's better for us to understand that these are, are different tools we use to solve different problems in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so my, my hammer doesn't need to be in conflict with my screwdriver. Right, right. So tell me, just how did you get the name Science Mike? Who started calling you that and why? Uh, it's a ridiculous story. <laughs> um, people's personality change when they drink too much. <laughs> so some people get angry. You start uh, waxing about. <laughs> I just talk about science yeah. endlessly. So I was at a party with some friends. And it had become kind of a party game where people try to get three beers in me and then ask me science questions. Because when I've had three beers, I don't worry about monopolizing conversations, talking about cosmology or whatever. And someone at the party, a friend of mine, Sarah, said, look at Science Mike wowing the crowd. And a couple of people were there that night and picked up on it. And uh, it just took off. And yeah. I really hated it at first yeah. because I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I'm a community college dropout. And uh, I feel like it like defiles the name of science. <laughs> but what I've tried to do once that moniker took over my whole life uh, was work really hard at being a good hype man for science yeah. and help people understand what science really is in our world and why it's really a good thing. Yeah. So what inspired you to go solo and start the Ask Science Mike podcast? Uh, I didn't have the idea. Oh, yeah. Uh, it would be wrong for me to say it was my idea. Liturgist Podcasts listeners mm. were complaining there wasn't enough science on the <laughs> Liturgist Podcast. They wanted more. Yeah. Um, and so someone tweeted out, Mike, you should start a second podcast that's only about mm. science. Yeah. And I retweeted that person and said, would anybody be interested? A lot of people did. Mm. So when I set that podcast up, uh, I think we had 3,500 subscribers before I posted the first oh, wow. show. Wow. Um, and then it only, it only grew from there. Wow. So, okay, speaking of podcasts, I read recently, according to Nielsen, that over half of American homes are podcast fans, are full of podcast fans. So, but on the other hand, millennials are attending church less and less, and yet you guys host a popular podcast that talks about religion and spirituality. Um, and so clearly there's this interest that exists, but maybe not in the way that traditional church is offering. So, you know, as a follower of Jesus, like, what do you think the solution to this is? Do you see this as a problem, or you know, is there a future for traditional church? I think the church, <clears throat> one, I think the church is reaping what it's sown in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. The alliance between faith institutions and American politics, mm -hmm. and the alignment between faith institutions and white supremacy, mm -hmm. um, the ground zero in opposition to LGBTQ equality mm -hmm. is American fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot there that the church is reaping what it has sown. Mm. But there's also an aspect that millennials and post-millennials in general are deinstitutionalizing. They aren't just leaving the church. Mm -hmm. They're leaving corporate ladders that last mm -hmm. their entire career. They're less involved in civic uh, projects. They're They're just not interested in being a cog in a machine. Right. There's a fundamental difference in viewpoint and perspective. I don't think the church is doomed because I think the church has the answers to some of the biggest mental health problems that we face in society. Mm. But I think as long as the church approaches millennials as a prospective audience to bring in and plug into their programs and turn into a donor base, mm -hmm. churches will continue mm. to shrink and collapse. Mm -hmm. I think if churches were to shift their focus into something that I would even call missional, mm. but I don't mean missional in terms of soul conversion, 
I mean missional in terms of community transformation, mm -hmm. and they were to invite the millennials in their community as partners and leaders in that work, I think they'd find um, that millennials are very, very hungry mm -hmm. to be involved in meaningful change in society yeah. and would love for the church to be a part of it. They're just not interested in a building fund for a nicer place to sit on Sunday mm. mornings. Yeah. All right, so for a softball, if you could choose two figures from the past who could be your next door neighbors, who would they be and why? Oh, wow. Um, I thought it would be really hard. It's not, actually. <laughs> I know exactly what it would be. It would be Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking. Uh, I could not hang with them, but if they were on either side of my house, they would have to cross me to get to each other. Yes. And then I could listen in on their conversations. I yeah. think that'd be really cool. Yeah. I thought you might have a science answer. <laughs> <laughs> I really do love it. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. And thank you for thank you. joining us on our interview.